And we've been looking at how numbers progress and finding those patterns. All right, you won't need your laptops anymore, so you can put those away. Um, we've looked at most of the vocabulary for the week. Today we're going to look at these last two terms, the common ratio, which is really what defines a geometric uh, sequence or series. Okay? Now, let's take a look at some... At a sequence here, we have 3, 12, 48, 192, 768, and so on. Okay? Now, obviously graphing 768 might be a challenge, so let's start with that. That's, a, that's our fifth term, right? So here's one two, three, four, five, and let's just put it way up here at the top. And relative to that, the previous one is 192, so that's going to be uh, about a quarter as high, maybe around there. And then 48 is a lot smaller than that, so it's about this high. And then we keep going down like that, okay? Now, you guys have all had Algebra 2 or the equivalent, so what function does that pattern look like? Exponential. It looks like an exponential. Alright, now just like the arithmetic was a linear and we don't technically connect the points, we wouldn't technically connect this, but you can see that exponential pattern. It's starting out slow and then it kind of shoots up. Alright, so what pattern do you actually see for the numbers in this case? Okay. Okay, we're multiplying that previous term by 4 each time. Okay, and by the way, that, what we described is kind of the recursive definition. All right, if the first term is 3, then... Every term, a sub k, well, let me use n to be consistent, a sub n is 4 times the previous term, a sub n minus 1. Mm -hmm. Can we do, um, could you just do like 3 times 4 to the n power instead? Can we get that inverse it? We're actually on the right, you're on the right track there, okay? Um, and we'll see that in a moment. The common ratio R, you guys just identified as 4. But let me explain how we can find that if it's not necessarily as obvious. Okay? How do we find the common ratio? A ratio is just a num another term for a what? A fraction. Good. A fraction. And a fraction is just a division problem, right? So, we need to divide two of the terms together to figure out what that common ratio is. Or, in fact, to see if there is a common ratio. The key here, though, is that you make sure you do it to where you're dividing a term by the previous term. Okay? So, if we took 12 and we divided it by 3, we would get 4. If we took 48 and we divided it by the previous term, 12, we would get 4. Okay? Now, notice I'm dividing consecutive terms. What would happen if I divided a term by not the previous one, but the one before that? What does that come out to? 16, okay, which happens to be 4 squared. squared, which makes sense, right, because how many steps did we take to get from 3 to 48? 2, Two. so we would have had to multiply by 4 twice, okay? So, this is how we can identify that common ratio, even if we don't have consecutive terms. If we know how many steps there are, 
between, say, 48 and 3, we can take a root, we can take a square root in this case, to figure out the common ratio is 4. All right? All right. Now, let's actually practice doing this a little bit, okay? When we're trying to write a geometric sequence, we're first of all going to find r, and then r is going to be the base of our exponential. Now, this right here is the general definition of a geometric sequence. a sub n equals a sub 1 times r to the n minus 1. Don't forget the minus 1 there. Okay? r to the n minus 1. Start multiplying by three instead of four. All right, one ninety-two helps if you multiply by the right number, um, and then seven sixty-eight. There we go. Okay, so there's our sequence. We're going to find a definition for that sequence. We already said r equaled four. So now we're going to write this as an exponential using r as the base, okay? So, a sub n equals a sub 1. What's a sub 1? 3 times r. What's r? 4 to the n minus 1. Now, one thing I would like you to do is to simplify, because when you see the definition of a geometric sequence, you don't usually see this minus 1 here. So th what I mean by simplify is, I want your final answer to have just a 4 to the n. Okay? So how would we simplify that? How can I get rid of the minus 1 in the exponent? Is that logarithm? If we were trying to like solve this for a particular value of a sub n, we could use a log, but in this case we don't need to. Will we change the 3 to 4 thirds or something? Ooh, you're on the right track. Okay. It will end up being 3 quarters. Can someone tell us how we get there? Where? Right. Um, it's like uh, it's like three times four uh, n square or uh, n divided by four, so we can cancel four, so it's like n minus one. Okay, so three times four to the n. And then this is like a divided by 4? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. If you remember your rules for exponents, if you have two things with the same base, like 4 to the n and 4 to the negative 1, what do you do with the exponents? Uh, you, you add them together, right? n plus a negative 1 would be n minus 1. So here's the negative 1 part, okay? There is another way you could think of this as well, and that would be um, to think of it in terms of this. If I had 4 to the n minus 1, how many more 4s do I need to get up to 4 to the n? 
I need to multiply by one more four, right? But I'm not allowed to just multiply by a four and change the whole problem. So what would I have to do to counter that? Divide it. I'd have to divide by four at the same time. See how that works? So there's kind of two ways you can think through this whole concept. You know, you multiply by a 4, and that'll cancel out the minus 1. So now we have a 4 to the n, but now we have to divide by a 4 to counter it. Or just think of it as separating that to a 4 to the n and a 4 to the, n, 4 to the negative 1. Okay? Either way, it'll work. Okay? All right. Good thinking. Good job. So the final answer is A to the N, or A centripetal equals three, three fourths times four. Yeah. Yes, this would be our final, our final answer. One comment I'll make is, don't round. Okay, if it comes out to a fraction and you punch it in your calculator or something, and you get some repeating decimal or some irrational number or something like that, do not round. Leave it as a fraction um, because, remember the graph? The further we go, the more this thing is going up, you know, it goes up faster. So one little decimal point rounding difference can make a very big difference in the value you get at the end. Okay, so don't round. All right, now, in this example, we knew what the first term was. Let's take a look at a, a situation where we don't know the first term. Okay? Here we know the fourth term and the tenth term. Okay? We know the fourth term, a sub 4, is 125, and we know a sub 10 is 125 sixty-fourths, 125 And we want to find the 14th term. Okay, now, there actually are two solutions for this. Because remember that negative, if we had a negative r, it could, because we have even number terms, it's possible that the ones in the middle could be going positive, negative, positive, negative, and so on. We'd still end up at the same place. So that's why I put this. We're going to assume that all the terms are positive, so our r is going to be positive as well. All right. But how would we go about finding this? What do you think? Okay, how could we find R? Yeah, we can plug these two into the formula that we have for A sub N. A sub N equals A sub 1 times R to the N minus 1. Okay? So let's see, A sub N, A sub 4 is 125. That equals a sub 1, but we don't know that, times r, we don't know that either, but it's to the n minus 1. So 4 minus 1 would be the third power. Okay? We could do the same thing over here. Uh, 125 60 fourths is going to be a sub 1 times r to the 10 minus 1, so r to the ninth power. Okay. So we actually have a system of equations here. We have two equations, there are two unknowns, so we don't know a sub 1 or r. So how would we go about finding it? Finding uh, what r is from here? Yes? Wouldn't you like isolate one of the variables and so you could plug it into other equations? Okay. Yeah, we could do that. Um, for example, if we 
Let's say we solve this one for a sub 1. Okay? a sub 1 would equal 125 over 64r to the 9th. That would work. And then, like you said, we could plug that into the other equation. We'd plug it in for a sub 1, and we'd have 125 equals a sub 1, which now we know is 125 over 64 r to the 9th times r to the 3rd. Does everyone follow what we did there? There's a, there's a few different ways that you could solve this system, and this is a good one, okay? Um, now it's just a matter of simplifying. I'm going to cancel out some of the R's here, so we actually have an R to the 6th in our denominator. 125 there, 125 here. Okay, let's multiply by 64r to the 6th to get rid of, or to get the r's out of the denominator. Okay, and I didn't bother multiplying those together because our next step is going to be divide by whatever this equals. Okay? That will cancel out and that will cancel out. And we're left with r to the 6th equals, this cancels out, so we have 1 64th. Okay? You may be able to figure out that this would be a half. Someone said that that's correct. Let's make sure we know how to do that with our calculators, because it's not always going to be one that we could figure out in our heads. Okay? So, get your calculators out. Where did mine go? My oh, here it is. Okay. Nope, oh, not that one. Okay, so how, when we're solving this, I mean, what are we actually doing mathematically here to get R? We're taking the sixth root. We have to take the sixth root of both sides. Now, you may have a calculator that allows you to take a root with a different index, you know, other than a square root. Um, <clears throat> however, this one, here we go. Here's our TA84. All right, we can punch in, we can figure this out one of two ways. Okay. Oh, it's not going to let me do it. Um, we can do six, and then under math, you'll see number five here is x, and then it has a little radical next to it. I punched in the six first because you have to put the index in front of it, and then choose number five, and then we'll punch in in parentheses. 1 64th, 1 divided by 64. Close your parentheses, and you'll get the 1 half. Okay? That's one way of doing it. Some calculators don't have this option. Just a moment. And what you can do instead, and actually I normally do it this way just because it's easier. Yeah. You raise it to a power. And what's the exponent that represents a sixth root? One-sixth. One-sixth. So make sure you put parentheses around it, but you raise it to the one-sixth power. 
and you get your one half that way as well. Okay? Did that answer your question? Or? All right, that makes sense. Okay, just be careful with that. One of the things that's going to be important throughout the year is that you learn how to use your calculators. All right, um, you are going to need a graphing calculator in this class. All right, that's on the course requirements. Um, an Inspire is great. A TI eighty four is great. Okay. If you're planning on going into some really higher level math, maybe making the investment in an Inspire would be worth it. Um, you know, if this is one of the last math classes you're taking in high school, then maybe just an 80, an 84 might be sufficient. Okay, but um, but you do need to have a graphing calculator uh, in order to be able to do everything we're going to do in this class. Okay. Now, if you want to bring the TI-30s with you to, like, for a quiz or a test or something or in class, obviously, you can do that. Um, some students find it easier to deal with things that have fractions in them or whatever with the TI-30. So you, you're welcome to have two different calculators with you, but you must have a graphing calculator, okay? And you need to really be bringing that every day so that you're learning how to use it. Okay. All right. Now, like we did with arithmetic sequences, we need to look at how to find sums or partial sums of geometric sequences. Okay. Let's start out looking at our formula here. The sum of the finite, finite geometric sequence starting at a sub 1 and going up to a sub 1 times r to the n minus 1, there you saw our definition, with a common ratio of r is given by s sub n equals the sum from i equals 1 to n of a sub 1 times r to the i minus 1. And then here's the, here's the part of the formula you've got to know, okay? The sum is going to equal a sub 1 times 1 minus r to the n over 1 minus r. a sub 1 times 1 minus r to the n over 1 minus r. So you're going to have to identify, hey, what's my first term, and what is the common ratio? All right, so for our example here, if I'm finding this sum, I'm really finding S sub what? 12. Okay. What is A sub 1? One point two, very good. Plug in a one for n, and I've got four times point three, which is one point two. So we have one point two times, and then in our parentheses, it's one minus r. What's r? Four. The point three. <clears throat> okay, r is always the thing that's being raised to the n power. Okay, so r is point three. And I need to raise that to what power in this case? The 12th power. It's r to the n. And then that's divided by 1 minus r. Okay? So now we just need to simplify that. Okay. Someone help us out. It's 1.2 because this calls for a sub 1. 
So if I plug a 1 in, I have 4 times 0 0.3 to the first power. Okay. All right, so what do we get when we uh, plug that in? It's a long decimal. Yeah. A long decimal? Okay. So let's round it. Um, it's like about 0 0.7. Okay, 0 0.7, what are the first few digits there? Uh, 69999. Oh, 6999? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, that would be good. Now, for that case, if it were 0 0.6999 and you had a bunch of nines there, let's say they asked you to round it to the nearest hundredth or two decimal places. To show that you actually did round it the way they said, you should go ahead and put the zero at the end, okay? It's kind of like in science, you have the significant figures. If you needed two significant figures, you would put a zero on the end to show that it was significant. Here, if you're asked to round to the hundredth, you should put a hundredths place, even if it's a zero, okay? By the way, those of you going on to IB, uh, two decimal places is the standard. Okay, they don't do sig figs, but they do two decimal places on everything. Or if you do AP, I think it's three. Yes? How do you put it in on the calculator? What I would do is maybe not try to put everything in at once. What I would do, and also I would do what I can in my head. So probably what I would do first of all is punch in the 1 minus 0.3 to the 12th. And then you guys know what 1 minus 0.3 is. So once you punch this in and hit enter, you get that value. Then you divide it by the 0.7, hit enter again, and then multiply it by the 1.2. Okay. Yeah. 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 Oh, um, well, let's see, 1 minus 0.3 this well, divided by 0.7. That's correct. You got, okay, so we got, we got a wrong answer, that's why. That's why we all do it, so we can check ourselves. What is it, 1.7? 1.4. Okay, so we could do that to the two decimals, 0.71. So yeah, if we do one and we've got the wrong answer, call it out, because I don't, I can do some stuff in my head, but I can't do this in my head. So. <laughs> All right, now, one thing to understand here is that this formula works when we are taking the sum from i equals 1 to n. Remember, partial sums always start at 1, okay? So, what do we do if we had a sum that doesn't start at 1? Okay, like this one. Okay, that's not a, that's not a bad idea. There's actually a, a little simpler way. Because see here, I'm starting at 0 instead of 1. So what could I do? Plug in the 0, right? If I did this, and I actually figured out what this equaled. Let's say it's 4 times 0.3 to the 0 power. The rest of the sum would be what we just found, right? So this is a really easy way, n equals 1 now, because we already have the 0 here, n equals 1 to 12 of 4 times 0.3 to the n. Okay, now we can use our formula for this part. All right, so we can just manually figure out what this term is and add it to the part that we get with our formula. All right. So we have 4 plus 
1.71. Okay? So we have 5.71. We did not get to the uh, infinite ones. We'll cover that on Monday. Okay? We'll look at that on Monday. We still should be able to do the majority of your uh, independent practice. Okay? Look on the website. I'll, uh, I'll take out the infinite ones for you. All right. Have a great weekend. Hopefully we'll see you on Monday.